Well, so we've got quite a few attendees that have joined us today. We've got 45 already. Welcome to Ahmed Hagezi. I'm assuming that's Ahmed from Hilton that I've known from a long time ago. Welcome, Charles Saliba. Lovely to have you with us today. It's been a long time as well. Um, welcome to uh, Gerald Laradang. Uh, also, Katrina Pruitt Andrews. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Welcome to Naji Kadura. It's great to have you with us. Naveen El Gamal from uh, Egypt. It's been a long time since I've spoken to you as well. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, thank you very much, Sebastian Leach, for joining us. Sharif Medhat dialing in from Egypt as well. So we've got a really good turnout. 48 attendees already have joined us on the call. So just give it a couple more minutes to see who else is going to be joining us. We've got 50 attendees now. Thanks, Naeem, for actually joining us today. Great to have you with us. We've got Craig Senior with us on today as well. Erica, thank you very much for joining us. Herzim Shauki, great to have you with us today. So just bear with us, everybody. Whilst I just share my screen today. So thank you all for joining us today. My name's Natalie uh, Nasser. I'm uh, an industry hospitality veteran as you can see by some of the people I was welcoming in today. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for our session on asset protection, investing in hospitality sales. We've got a great one hour to share some a wealth of information with you today. And I'm delighted that as HSMAI Middle East, we are able to organize such an amazing session in collaboration with Noland. And Christy White, the VP of product, will be sharing some great insights into what is happening currently in the industry. So Hi. Christy's, Hi, Christy. So Christy's an industry veteran with over 17 years in the hospitality industry, where she was responsible for driving commercial initiatives, overseeing sales and revenue management. She's also got over 13 years experience advising on hotels on how to make more money, which is what we all need right now. I'm sure you'd all agree in this uh, very difficult landscape. We all need to actually make a little bit more money. So before we hand over to Christy, though, I'd like to share some more details on HSMAI especially for any newcomers who might have joined us on the call today and who'd like to learn a little bit more about what we do in the region. So welcome to HSMAI Middle East, the regional chapter of the globally accredited Hospital Hotel Sales and Marketing Association. So who are we? We're actually a non-profit association that was founded in 1927. We have over 7,000 members in 60 chapters spanning 31 countries. And we are the largest and most active hospitality marketing association in the world. Our regional mission is to create a community that will advance our industry by providing leading educational initiatives, sharing best practices, and most importantly, networking opportunities for commercial leaders and senior managers in both the hospitality industry alongside our industry partners. We've got a seasoned steering committee from all disciplines who actively support all HSMAI activities throughout the year, focusing on education, on sharing best practices, and on networking, where we culminate at the end of the year with a key event that's held in the region, the Revenue Optimization Conference, which brings both industry experts and partners together for two days of dialogue and deep learnings. And this is our KSA steering committee. And by joining us, our members have the opportunity to connect with industry peers and colleagues, gain learnings through a wealth of trainings and seminars on offer, and learn more about the trends in the industry from our partner experts who are based around the globe. At HSMI, we are all about growth, both personally and within your careers. 
And these are just some of the benefits that are enjoyed by our members. Up to three complimentary trainings, workshops and networking events per annum. Discounts to attend the one and only revenue optimization conference Hi, that's Nat. held in the region. Sorry. Special mem Hi, Natalie. Special mm. Sorry, you're not sharing your screen. We cannot see your screen right now. Has it gone off or could you see the rest of it? It's gone off. Okay, let me see if I can reload it. Just bear with me one moment. I don't know what's happened, Jean, because according to mine, it's still sharing. All right, no problem. You can carry on. Okay, let me try again. I'll try again. Let me get it back up and let me try again. Just bear with me. technical issues that's okay Nat let's go for it okay let's carry on let's carry right. on that uh, now we can see it you just oh now you can see it yeah, okay perfect the presenter mode thank you okay excellent you've got it again all right let me go back so these are our member benefits sorry everybody for the technical glitch bound to happen to me but it's all good so you'll get up to three complimentary training workshops and networking events. You'll get discounts to attend the one and only revenue optimization conference. You'll also get special member rates for the global programs that we actually um, deliver. You've got free access to lots of marketing intelligence and weekly insights in both the Middle East chapter and the other chapters around the world. And you have access to a globally recognized certification program in digital marketing, revenue management, and in business acumen. And these are the three globally recognized programs that you can have access to where you can register and study at your own pace using the study guides. And you only need to take the online exam when you're actually ready and comfortable to take that exam. So who are our associates and our members? We work with um, our Middle East chapter proudly recognizes the brands that we are associated with. And we've got members from across all different brands within the industry. So from IHG, Hyatt, Four Seasons, Rotana, the Ascot, too many brands to mention, but a wide, diverse audience. We also have our associate partners that we work very closely with to share their insights on the industry. So we're very grateful to working with all these partners and to be able to, able to share with you all of the great insights that they share with us on a regular basis. So become a member now, and if you become a member before 30th of April, you can enjoy free access to 2021's Revenue Optimization Conference, where all commercial professionals from sales, revenue management and marketing can gain learnings and insights um, by networking and uh, joining all of the fantastic sessions that we have over the two day conference. So thank you all very much for listening, and I'm delighted to hand over to Christy where you can learn more about protecting our assets and investing more in hospitality sales teams. So over to you, Kirsty. Thanks. So let's share my screen. Everyone should be able to see that now. Natalie, can you see it? Just confirm for me, please. I can absolutely see it. And sorry, Kirsty, ah. just before you begin, everybody, if anybody has got any questions that you'd like to ask Kirsty whilst we're going through the presentation, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat box and uh, we'll be able to answer the questions as we go along. Fantastic. I was going to say that. So thanks for covering that for me, Natalie. Welcome everyone to today's program. It's frightfully early for me in the United States, but it's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, so without further ado, we're going to kind of kick off because, you know, as we've had a rough year, it's probably the roughest year in the 30 odd years I've been in the hospitality industry. And we've got to get back to doing business. And the first way is protecting our asset. So the way that we protect our asset is investing in our sales teams because they're the ones who are going to lead us out of this and get us on the path to recovery. Now, um, I have our VP of marketing who's on the call listening um, as an attendee, and she's going to laugh when I make this next statement because I'm an eternal optimist. 
actually that's not really true. I'm a realist, but I'm also optimistically real, realistic that we're on the path to recovery. So we'll get started and start looking through the agenda. Now, I'm a big fan of the concept of plan your work and work your plan, but I prefer a slightly different version of that. And it's make your plan work. And to do that, we need to know what we're going to cover today. So we're gonna have a quick conversation about the numbers and understand why Dubai has reason to be optimistic. We're going to talk about how COVID has changed how our sales team and what they might not and why that might not necessarily be a bad thing. Um, as we celebrate those smaller teams, it might be time to look at how to, at how to reevaluate how we look at selling and managing accounts. Then we're going to have a real conversation about how your comp set might be your own worst enemy. And then for the near future, um, booking windows have been dr drastically altered and how we might be able to take advantage of that or at least uh, manage it effectively so that we're optimizing our revenues. And then finally, we're going to get to wrap it all up and get some homework because I do like to assign homework. You didn't think you were coming here for free, did you? Now, throughout the presentation, we're going to ask you guys a series of question, questions and we have our first question coming up now. Um, so we're going to go ahead and launch that poll. How do you feel your hotel is doing relative to the market? Do you think you're well ahead of the market, you're pacing slightly behind the market, um, or you're well behind the market? So go ahead and take a few moments to answer those questions for us. Um, you should have a box that popped up on your screen. You're just going to tick one of those and give us an answer. So when we've asked this question in the United States, um, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. We get the we're in line with the market and we're or we're pacing slightly behind the market. But it's always nice before we go into our numbers to, to have a feel for that. We'll give this just another couple of seconds. OK, we're going to go ahead and get just two more seconds. And now we're actually going to show those results. You should be able to see those specifically on your screen. As we look into those, it's interesting. We're seeing that those same results here. 19% of you guys are um, in line with the market. 39% are pacing slightly behind the market. I always have to give a shout out to those people who are saying they're well behind the market because I think even in, in an anonymity, it takes a little bit of bravery to admit that. And we've got a handful of people who are well ahead of the market. So now we'll actually take that step forward and start looking into those numbers and what this looks like. So here we're looking at the month by month occupancy for Dubai since 2019. And there are a couple of highlights in this. Starting in July, we see the market ramp up fairly steadily. And I'm adding, gonna add another metric to this to show why I'm excited about what's happening in the Dubai market and specifically in Dubai. And this metric is the capture rate. It's a fairly simple metric to understand. It's the current occupancy rate divided by the 2019 occupancy at the same time. And it's designed to understand how much of 2019 demand the market has recaptured. And it's an important metric to track because it lets you understand how close you are to recovery. You could additionally, I calculate it for your hotel and then compare it to the market as a whole to see where you sit. Knowing this can be very important to understand what your steps, next steps might be. With all of that said, and for the month of December, the market recaptured 84.3% of 2019 demand. And year to date through February, the market is already at 80% of 2019 demand. And this is unique across the rest of the world. I know there have been some recent setbacks in the region, but by comparison to the rest of the world, you guys are actually leading the way, which is sort of unusual in, in, in prior downturns. And this is a little bit different because it's more of a disruptor than a downturn. Asia Pacific has recovered first, and then that spreads um, into the Middle East, Europe, and then to the United States. And we're actually seeing recovery occur a little bit differently. So with that in mind, we'll actually move forward and take a look at the, um, so looking at Dubai, now we're gonna take a look at Middle East as a whole. And that those recovery numbers that we were looking at, they're specific to Dubai because the Middle East and Africa as a whole, they're not climbing quite as big. They started in July, just like Dubai saw, but by December, the region as a whole had only recaptured 62.6% .6 of demand and year to date through February has only recaptured 59.1%. So even within your own specific region, you're, you're doing better. Um, if we move a little bit further and look into Asia Pacific, so they were the first that went into this, one would anticipate they'd be the first to recover, but they even haven't hit quite hit that magical 80% capture metric. And I want to stop and talk about that 80% for a moment, because that's the, that's the
selling those, selling your hotels and getting those relationships restarted with hotels. So even Asia Pacific hasn't reached there. They peaked in December at 72.3% and year to date through February, they've actually fallen back to only 52.5% capture. As we move into the United States, as soon as my screen will move, um, we're beginning to pick up pace. In, Dece in December, we recaptured 64.4% of the 2019 occupancy. We had a little drop off year to date um, through February, where we're actually sitting at 56.8, but the, that number has now begun to come up. And for the running 28 days, the region is at 51.1% occupancy. Last week, the market ran 54.8% market uh, occupancy with a capture rate of 79%. So the United States has begun its march out of this and moving in the general right direction. We've actually got a handful of markets in the United States that are running above 80% occupancy. Obviously, it's not the whole world, but that we're, you know, we're definitely seeing these green shoots of, of recovery all around the country. And then lastly, we'll take a quick look at Europe and what's going on there. Now, Europe is lingering behind all of the other regions. They fell further and harder than the other regions. And the highest capture rate they've had was in September at 48.3%. But by December, it fell back to 25.7%. And year to date through February, they're even lower at 20.9%. And now many of the countries are looking at a fourth lock time, lockdown. These numbers aren't likely to recover anytime soon. And I know that that potentially can be a bad thing for Dubai because you're sometimes dependent upon that travel, that travel from the, Europe to come into Dubai, um, especially in that my segment. But for the most part, Dubai and the United States, recovery is well underway. And now it's time for hotels to start taking advantage of it. So we've spent a little bit too long in hibernation. So that brings us to poll question number two. So we'll go ahead and kick that one off. And our question here is, what does your sales team staffing look like? The same as before COVID, half of the staff pre-COVID, a quarter of the staff pre-COVID, or you have no current sales staff. Okay, we'll take just a couple of seconds. Um, now, the really nice thing that's in here as we as we look into this is in the US, we're actually beginning to see staff come back. Uh, but for most of the hotels, when we've asked this question, we've been sitting at that quarter of the staff um, and half of the staff. We only have a handful of hotels that are back to the staffing levels of pre-COVID, but we do still have a lot of hotels that are sitting in that no current sales staff. So we'll give it a couple of more seconds and then we'll close out this one and look at those results. So as we look at this, it looks like most of you guys are sitting in that about half of the staff of pre-COVID. And we do have a handful that are saying they have no current staff and you're not alone in this. There are a lot of hotels out there that are still in that bucket. But I'm surprised to see that number of hotels with the same as before COVID. So bravo to your owners. That's a, a unique accomplishment. And I hope you guys are taking full advantage of that. Um, the reason I ask that is because, you know, as we look at this, there is that there's a little bit of fun that can be had we often think that small teams are, um, are a downsized force, but bigger doesn't always mean better. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, has a personal belief that if a team couldn't be fed with two pizzas, it was too big. The conventional wisdom that two heads are better than one or the more brains you have on a problem, the better, is completely wrong. People in smaller teams are far more personally productive. And you might ask, why is that? Well, with smaller teams, the leader has the ability to spend more time with the other sellers, making sure they're focused on the right priorities. Those priorities are going to shift often during recovery, especially after something like a disruptor. So keeping the team focused on those new opportunities and which ones exist will make sure you're ready to capitalize them on, on them as they emerge. And in a small team, you're more able to do that because there's a little more one-on-one -on -one attention. Additionally, there's a chance your sales team, maybe you brought back your entire sales team, the, the original people, and maybe you had to hire new people, but there's a chance that they may not have all of the training that they need. Make sure they're sharpening their skills. This might include role-playing with them or them role-playing with each other. It might also mean investing in the right tools to help with their education. There are a lot of great tools out there around sales enablement that actually help with the cadence of when and why you should call particular customers. Those are things that now that we're a little bit slower, we have that time to implement and implement properly. 
Smaller teams need to be able to do more with less. So having that the right tools will allow them to target the right accounts. And technology is your friend where that's concerned because you wanna make sure that you're targeting the right accounts, that you're following up with them appropriately and that you're capturing more of their wallet share. And additionally, it can help management better monitor the progress. Monitor progress. I'm a huge fan of technology. Obviously I work for a technology company, but even when I was working in hotels, I was one of those people that had a CRM lock long before everyone else did and, and used revenue management systems. So making sure that you have the right tools and even more importantly, that your team is appropriately trained to use those tools. Um, streamlining the sales process. So playbooks are one of the most effective ways to present your hotel to prospective clients, and they should be segmented and personalized to the market segment and the type of client. This is going to help with branding as well as helping newer, less experienced salespeople stay on target. Um, this is something that I found over the last 10 years that most hotels didn't have playbooks. It was sort of everybody had their own sales spiel that they talked about the hotel. Getting back to those basics during a time of disruption will actually help you jump leapfrog this and actually streamline your sales process and getting salespeople to the yes quicker. Um, finally, uh, then looking at that, identifying those barriers to success because too often salespeople get bogged down in administrative issues. Eliminate all of those and get them focused on selling. I spent a long part of my career as a regional director of sales. And as I would walk into my hotels, there was nothing that galled me more than to walk in and find a front desk person at the front desk or no, a salesperson at the front desk answering a phone or, you know, over in the restaurant pouring a cup of coffee because that someone was short staffed. Your sellers should be selling. And as a leader, you should be doing everything that you can to remove any of their obstacles to keep them from selling. A lot of times what I also found is my, my poor sellers would use those as excuses not to go sell. <clears throat> and then the last thing is creating those effective sales plans, plans. This goes back to your plan your work and work your plan. Each salesperson should have goals and prioritization strategies, and those need to be revisited regularly and monitored for progress. One thing that we've seen as we have, as we have observed meetings come back to the market is the segments are changing very rapidly. So you have to be paying attention to what's driving business into your market and be ready to shift immediately to target those if they're the appropriate segment for your hotel. And then lastly in this is cel about celebrating the wins. Small teams will likely be working harder and it's important to celebrate their wins. An important caveat in this though is what you celebrate today is probably vastly different than what you would have celebrated a year or 15 months ago. It's important to make sure that all of the key stakeholders understand what success looks like today and why you're, you're celebrating so that you don't create dissonance because you're celebrating smaller wins than what you would have celebrated 15 months ago. Now, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is a slight change. And I hope there are a lot of hotels that are already doing this, but we're gonna talk about total account revenue management um, or total account management. My background is in revenue management as well. Um, I worked for an RMS, I've used RMSs. And for about the last five to eight years, one of the big battle cries has been total revenue management. And I believe inside of sales, we also need to have total account management. So it's that build the relationship and the transaction will follow. Now, that might sound like something straight from the screenplay of Field of Dreams, but in the world of relationship and transactional selling, this simple group of words embodies sincerity, morality, and the result of proven results, proven tactics impossible to dispute. So before we explore the reasons why relationship selling is clearly more beneficial than transactional selling, let's take a look at each of these approaches individually. As we look at this total account management, it's important to look at it from both the sales perspective, so your seller in seat, and the customer perspective that we're going to, to start this. Now, a lot of this transactional selling started over the last 10 years as RFPs have become more dominant within our industry and business was just walking in the door. So we sort of abandoned that relationship component when we were dealing with customers. So as you're looking at it from the salesperson, so the in-seat salesperson, these transactional things are one time. They're single transaction without regard of other opportunities. And this type of, like I said, this type of process became heavily prevalent over the past 10 years because of RFPs. 
in a relationship sales um, sales scenario with the, the salesperson is invested in capturing as much wallet share. So you're trying to get as much business that uh, this particular customer has as possible. And it's achieved by maintaining that long relationship with the client and using existing contacts to make new contacts within an organization. Transactional is very short term, and it's because of the singular nature of the business in this category. The connections here are transitory and limited, and that makes it even harder to capture more wallet share. Having an ongoing relationship with clients allows a good salesperson to deepen that connectivity and ultimately grow the business, not just from that contact, but from other contacts within that organization. Um, customer contact with the co in, in the transactional is very low, and it's typically limited to the needs of the single event and then laps once the event has come and gone. This type of relationship is extraordinarily shallow. On the other side of that spectrum is the, the frequent contact. The salesperson gets to know the contact. They develop a bond that extends beyond the business to a include a level of trust not achieved with the transactional relationship. On the transactional side, we're always focused on who's the next customer because we've got to fill our pipeline. And that single transaction, you, 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 don't, you don't know where the next thing's coming from. This ultimately does create more peaks and valleys because you don't have that ongoing relationship. When you develop those deeper relationships, both individually and throughout an organization, it means the salesperson knows all or most of the business the account has, and they can use that to build the pipeline and better eliminate peaks and valleys that occur in the transactional model. Finally, there's limited loyalty. The customer doesn't have a commitment to the salesperson or the product. Each new transaction is viewed independently. And this additionally creates a scenario where your product is commoditized. So this limits your ability to drive rate um, in any space, whether it's transient or group. On the other side of this, because of the relationship, the customer views the salesperson as a partner. Through the deepening of the relationship, they think less about the price and more about the partnership. So that's looking at it from the salesperson, so the person in seat. If we take the same lens and look at it from the, the customer side, you'll actually see how these begin to play out. So on this side, this is how the customer responds to the different types of relationships. And these responses, again, impact your ability not only to sell, but also grow revenues. So on the transactional side, that customer is focused on today. They're only focused on the business at hand. Your product is there for their convenience. When you get into a relationship selling type thing, the customer talks about the full scope of their business. They're looking at each transaction as the stepping stone to the next transaction. On the transactional side, the customers negotiate everything. And I suspect if you take a moment and think about your, your customers, you know a handful of these customers. They're extraordinarily price sensitive and their decisions will be based on the lowest price. On the opposite side of that, these customers are focused on the right solution for their needs. Price is a secondary consideration because they want the right partner, not the cheapest price. For our transactional customers, they're all about the thrill of the chase. These customers enjoy the process of finding new places, not because they're looking for the best fit, because they know in a single transaction, they can push the price lower by letting the salesperson know they're shopping around. Partners are relationship customers. They don't enjoy that process of evaluating a product or service. They're looking for a home. They prefer to have one or two reliable vendors to partner with. They long for that comfort of knowing they'll be taken care of. The transactional customer doesn't want an expert because they believe themselves to be the expert. They're looking for dates, rates, and space. The relationship guy, they, they're looking for a partner. They believe you are the expert and they're willing to pay you for your expertise to service their needs. These customers have limited price sensitivity. The last piece of this is those, those transactional customers when they're out there talking about you and they may spread the word about you, but that word likely won't be about how good the event was or how good of a salesperson you are. Their word of mouth will be limited to what a cheap rate they negotiated. Customers gained from this word of mouth will be coming to you looking for their good deal. On the opposite side of this, these customers repeat. And when they talk about your product, they'll talk about what a great partner you are and what a great experience they had. They won't talk about price. As recovery takes hold and builds throughout the year, hotels need to be focused on relationships to help drive business long term. 
getting ahead of these relationships now means you'll be able to take advantage of them when the recovery fully kicks in. So this brings us to our third poll question. Um, and it's a preface to the next slide, which is how defined are you by your competitive set? Do you live and die by the competitive set? It's how you build all your action plans. It's important, but you recognize you might miss opportunities. You pay attention to it, but only as a guide. You have one, but it doesn't inform all of our processes and or you don't have a competitive set. Now, I've asked this question in other markets over the last few months. And typically what we're actually finding is it they either fall in that first bucket pretty pretty firmly or somewhere in bucket three or four. So I'll be interested to see what your specific results are as you're as you're going through here. And then we're going to have a little conversation about comp sets. So we'll give this just another couple of seconds. And thanks guys for participating in these so so happily. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close that one out and show those results. So it looks like you guys are falling in roughly the same categories um, that we see. So you're paying attention to it, but only as a guide. Got a handful in there that are looking at it. This is how you build all of your action plans. And then we have a few brave souls that say they don't even have a competitive set. And I'm hoping on that, that it means that you don't, you're not subscribing to some uh, subscription model versus you don't have competitors because that's never really true. Um, so we'll take a step, step forward and we'll start talking about competitive sets and how we want to go. So com comp sets have defined how we measure our business since the mid 1980s. We're incented against them, have built our action plans around them, but too often they are also a prison we live in that limits our ability to, tr our, to truly grow our business. Um, disruptors like COVID create bedlam in how our customers do business. It's going to make some of them look to cheaper alternatives to save money, while others will buy up because of the lower rates available uh, at brands they've never been able to use before. If we don't evolve past the five to eight hotels in our competitive set, we doom ourselves to miss out on these shifting trends and miss opportunities that could drive revenue higher. The five to eight hotels in your competitive set do not make up all of your competition. Perhaps they represent all of your competition in a single market segment, but viewing your ability to acquire business based solely on a competitive set limits your ability to drive revenue long term and even in the short term. Comp sets create an inherent myopia. If you're solely focused on those hotels, you might miss that a key account has moved elsewhere. Recovery is going to come from everywhere. Understanding what's driving recovery in the market as a whole is the only way you'll be able to capitalize no matter what's happening around you. This is where a good, strong business intelligence tool that gives you forward-looking data so that you can understand what's driving the occupancy in a market as a whole from a, at the segmentation level is one of your most valuable things that you can have. Um, so customers are looking up, down, and all around. Obviously, if you're a luxury hotel, you may not need to worry about economy hotels, but you may need to worry about the upscale hotel. The best rule of thumb is to look up and or down one chain scale. This will help you identify business that's shifting because of rate shifts in markets. This is mostly going to help with transient business. However, with group business and that my segment, you need to monitor size as well as chain scale. Meetings are smaller now, so organizations might be looking at hotels with less meeting space than you have. Being flexible with the hotels you monitor based upon their meeting space is crucial. That 4,000 square foot hotel you've overlooked for years might just be the market leader now. If you've neglected them in the past and can you continue to do so, you do so at your own pe peril. And perhaps the biggest reason why comp sets matter less at times like this, your customers don't know who's in your comp set. They're going to go where they find the best value and even more importantly, the best relationship. Stepping outside the comfort zone of your comp set will allow you to understand not only where your customers might be booking, but also what other customers are booking. Once you have a clear understanding of the overall demand, not just what exists in your small comp set, you can develop accurate sales strategies to target the business. More importantly, your revenue team can partner to help you price more effectively. Uh, the most consistent thing that we've seen across the globe is the shortening of booking windows. Transient bookings are impacted the most with 90% occurring within 45 days. Last summer, that number was as low as 30 days with 80% occurring within five to seven days. 
as a former revenue manager, that actually gives me heart palpitations because forecasting around that becomes nearly impossible. And it's something that you're having to take on every single day. You're having to adjust your algorithms in order to forecast more accurately. As group returned to the market, it started to mirror this pattern. For the most part, these are smaller groups and they're often booking and in, they're inquiring and booking at the same time. So planners aren't really shopping, they're simply booking. So if your hotel doesn't have staff available, they might be missing out. Um, we've had a couple of anecdotal calls. I've had, I do a, a, a monthly podcast and I've had a few meeting planners on. And the one thing that we're hearing consistently is often when they call hotels, they can't get a live person. So when they get a live person who can actually check availability and give them rates and information, they just go ahead and book these small meetings. So making sure you've got someone there during business hours that's actually dedicated to selling is actually is very vital for your hotel. For the bookings that are for that are deeper in the year, planners are looking for relaxed attrition and cancellation cause, clauses. So do be careful of that and make sure that you have them where you protect yourself, but you're also flexible enough for the meeting planner. All of this means that we need to be more careful of rate than ever. Year to date through February, Dubai is down 13% in ADR, which by the way, is actually one of the best ones out there. Uh, the Middle East as a whole is down 9.2%. And this is not, like I said, it's not as bad as other regions, but it's still going to require time to rebuild that rate. Um, if you're discounting transient rates nine months from now, that's going to impact both your group and your wholesale rates. With booking windows so short, transient rates should only be managed for short, a shorter period of time. So you really should only be manipulating rates around that transient business for the next 30 to 45 days. Anything past that should probably stay where you would like to be priced if we were at a fully recovered period. That's going to protect your, your group and your wholesale rates a little further down the line and allow you to recover more quickly. And then lastly, all of this impacts our ability to forecast effectively. Historical numbers aren't as meaningful as they normally are, so savvy revenue managers will need to constantly read the tea leaves to make sure they're staying up to date with shifting trends. And this is, again, where those good business intelligence tools that look at pace for the market as a whole will be most effective. And we need to make sure that we're functionally partnering with our, our revenue managers to make sure that everybody understands what our rate strategy looks like. Okay. Um, and this should take us to our last poll question of the day, which is around what your optimism level is for, um, for recovery. There we go. So how confident are you in, in recovery? The back half of 20, 2021 is going to be phenomenal. 2021 is going to be okay. It's going to be a simply be a building block. Recovery won't come until 2022, and recovery won't come until beyond 2022. Now, this is where my hope, my eternal optimism comes in, because I actually believe the back half of 2020 is going to 2021 is going to be fairly phenomenal, especially for those hotels who are laying the groundwork to capture that business now. Um, and then I think 2022 is going to be absolutely outstanding. I do think the hotels that are going to win in this scenario are the ones who have done the best job of protecting rate and trying to get back to those 2019 levels. We're going to go ahead and close out this poll and look at the results. All right, so it looks like, mo um, you know, everybody's kind of in the cautiously optimistic. We've got a handful of people who are thinking recovery is not going to rec occur until next year. And then a few, you know, dare I say pessimists that are look, thinking that recovery won't come until tw uh, beyond 2022. Um, I'm, again, I'm in the, it's going to, the back half is going to look pretty good, but it's dependent upon what you're doing uh, as a hotel right now on where you're going to hit in those particular buckets. So as we begin to wind down the presentation, um, there, here's, I'm going to give you guys a few takeaways and a few homework items, and then you can ask me all the questions that you want. But as we step into this, now is the time to invest. When the full recovery comes, it's going to come very quickly. You need to have a few salespeople in seat ready to take advantage. 
good business intelligence tools that help you understand how the market is performing and what's driving the business is absolutely critical. Comparing that to what's driving your business is even more critical. Are there niche segments that you can, ex you can exploit? Without the right tools and the right people to leverage those tools, recovery will pass you by. I work with a handful of hotels here in the United States and uh, with one in Australia, and they've all been very successful because they found those markets that were actually booking into their, their particular market as a whole, those segments that were marking, booking in their market, and then they attacked those segments and tried to capture those. Some of that it, here in the United States specifically, very early on, they were COVID um, quarantine hotels hotels. So those people that had been exposed that didn't want to go home and potentially expose their family and stayed in hotels, doctors and nurses who didn't want to go home in the evenings and stayed in hotels. And they actually captured that business very early on. Extended stay crews for construction crews that needed to be. There were lots of different segments and they found that through their business intelligence tools and got their salespeople on there immediately. Booking windows have already shifted and will continue to shift. Every person on your team who books any type of business needs to be aware of this. They also need to be aware of how this is impacting your pricing and why, um, and why it only takes one person to ruin um, and why, sorry, it only takes one person to ruin good rate strategy. By educating every revenue generating person on staff, you can prevent this and practice rate integrity that will leapfrog your recovery. And as I said just a couple of minutes ago, it's those hotel, hotels that are doing the best job of, pr of protecting their rate that are going to recover first, not just from an occupancy perspective, but from a revenue perspective. And that's where I think there will be some delays is from those hotels that are not taking care of that rate strategy. Um, comp sets will not lead you out of recovery. During times of disruption, business shifts up, down, sideways. You might be a luxury hotel competing with a select feature hotel. If you aren't looking everywhere, you won't know until it's too late. Now's the perfect time to dust off your SWOT analysis and redo them. Broaden them to be more inclusive and be brutally honest with yourself so you can understand where and why an account might be shopping around. Taking those SWOT analysis and tying that back to your business intelligence tools to understand where a business might be slipping is a very important feature as well. Um, RFPs won't return for a long time. Knowing your accounts and understanding their entire book of business, not just their transactions that they've had with you in the past, will make your hotel virtually recession proof. People do business with people they know, and it's a great way to prevent your hotel from being treated like a commodity. Looking at business as a one and done transaction is death by a thousand cuts. Right now, there are uh, might not be a lot of meetings or groups happening, but each one should be treated as an opportunity to land a whale. I worked um, for a brief period in casinos. Landing a whale means that you've landed someone that's a is going to come spend a lot of money in your casino. And we should sort of treat accounts that this is the, my opportunity to find that core account. If your salespeople aren't thinking that way, find salespeople who do think that way. And then finally, difficult times require nimble people. Celebrate your wins as they come in and recognize that what's a win today might not have been a win a year ago, and it's probably not going to be a win a year from now. Evaluate what you're doing and its level of success. Choose to fail fast. We, everybody fails. That is a fact of life. But when you fail, make sure you do it quickly and you recover even quicker. It's going to take multiple tries, but when you hit that winning formula, you're going to know it because you're going to see it in your numbers. Finally, recovery is coming and it's coming quicker than we think. Savvy hoteliers are already prepared and have put together the teams and tools they need to attack the moment the green shoots appear. And I'm here to tell you today that the green shoots are everywhere. You just have to kind of look around for them. That's the end of my presentation. And now if we have questions, let's uh, let's do them, Natalie. Okay, thanks a lot, Christy. That's absolutely fantastic. So if anybody's got any questions, if they'd like to put some questions in the chat boxes, that'll be great. And I'll be able to ask Christy all of your fantastic questions. So Christy, we've got one question first. So. Mm -hmm. How do I know if my team is practicing total account management? So you should be able to look through your CRM and see if they're making those phone calls that are not related to a specific, sing a specific single piece of business. Um, 
one of the, the surest ways that I did it is to look at the, the contact in my CRM and see what level of detail had been filled out to, to the contact. Um, I found the ones that were practicing total account management most regularly were the ones that knew the birth dates, um, knew specific things like, did they have kids, those types of things, because it showed that there was a deepening of that relationship. But monitoring the pattern of communication but for individual contacts within an organization was the, the surest fire way. If you were seeing regular communication, and it wasn't always a, hey, you know, do you have a meeting or things like that? It was sometimes that they saw an article that they per thought the person might find interesting, was sending over a recipe, those types of things. Anything that was beyond the very transactional nature of what was going on tended to be the, the indication. The other thing that I found is examining the nature of business that was coming from a particular organization. Um, if I was seeing those numbers go up and, and seeing with different types of meetings, then I knew that those were the typical meetings. Those were the people that were practicing the better. You should be looking at the the total value of of the account, and and that was the the truest way. Oh, that's fantastic. So basically, delve deeper into your CRM to see what your what your team are inputting and how well you know that or how deep that relationship is with the account. And obviously, watch your trends, look at the numbers. It's very difficult to make comparisons at the moment versus previous years. But yeah, see what's happening with the numbers. And if you're seeing, you know, regular patterns, then uh, I'm sure there's kind of more regular contact as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's that combo. Like right now, as you said, Natalie, it's going to be difficult because we just don't have the numbers to support it. But if you see that regular cadence of communication, then that's what that's where your truest sign of total account management comes from. Yeah, and then they'll benefit in the future when the business does come back anyway. So that's a fantastic. You know, absolutely, because it's the, you know, you should get to a point with relationships where they're not, they, they don't, they, they're, they will, let me just pause there for a second. There's a theory that by the time something makes it to an RFP, you've probably already lost the piece of business. I worked in technical sales for a long time with a revenue management company. And when we would get these large RFPs, I could just read through it and tell you which company they had selected and the decision date hadn't come because they had partnered with that company to throw in questions that only that company could at, could answer mm -hmm. pro appropriately. And you see the same thing in hospitality sales as well, that you'll get an RFP and there, there'll be one or two questions in it where you're like, oh, they're looking at that hotel because they've already made the decision. They're going through the, the machinations they need to internally in order to get the bid, uh, but they're not really looking. If you get ahead of that and you become that partner, then you, you're in it before they ever send it out to RFP and you've got that chance of, of winning the business. That's where you wanna get. And the only way you can get that is by having that relationship. Yeah, some really good points there. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, we've also got another one. What are the biggest challenges in the industry at the moment? <laughs> um, so that I would, I, there, there are three um, ownership because I, they want everything to be back the way it was. And they're probably a little, um, I'm not going to say less, a, a little less inclined to spend money because of it. But now you're, go, you're actually going to have to invest. This is that moment you're going to have to start spending money in order to get there. Um, the second thing is, you know, and this is, may seem a little inappropriate. I don't think salespeople are prepared for the effort of selling. Um, we, we became complacent and business was just walking in the door and we didn't necessarily need to do anything to sell other than have the space available and give them the appropriate rate. Um, anytime you have a disruptor like this, you have to go back to the old knocking on doors building those relationships. And I don't know how many salespeople out there still have those functional skills to be able to do that. Um, it's something that our company specifically is focusing on and helping with that training. We've partnered with a couple of really good vendors to, 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 to put together sessions on how to do that um, because we recognize it. And then I think the third thing is, is the pessimism that is just has, I think, sort of natively take hold, taken hold. Um, it's the first recession or down, downturn I've ever been through where I, I talk to people and they don't feel like there's going to be, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel um, other than the train. 
And um, I, I think that becomes this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy because you're like, oh, they're not going to have business, so I'm not going to call them because I don't want to be depressed today. And we're going to have to get over that. And our native optimism needs to come back and figure out how to have conversations where it's not about inquiring about the business. It's about inquiring about the person. How, how's your business going? Those types of things, shifting that conversation. And ultimately, that helps us get back to developing those relationships. Yeah, some really good points there. Uh, we need to move from uh, gatherers to being hunters again. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you shared that, in, you know, you've got a critical focus in your company uh, to do that uh, through training. Uh, owners will continue to be a, a little bit of a challenge because obviously they, they're looking at it in the long term um, and they're monitoring their spend quite closely. So, uh, and I think that will be ongoing. It's very true. But as, as kind of as there's the green shoots, as you called them and referenced them earlier on, as those green shoots start coming in, I think we will see, see a little bit more of a relaxation in terms of some of the spend. Absolutely. The questions... it's, just pause there for a second, Nelly. It's one of the reasons I like the metric of a capture rate um, and showing how much of that demand you've recaptured, because you can track that over time. If you have access to weekly occupancy reports, you can compare that to 2019. If you've got good solid action plans, you can marry those together and say, we did these three things and our capture rate went from X to Y. Um, and that begins to show ownership that there is movement in the right direction. And usually if you can show them that there's movement, they are relative to spend, relative to activity, they begin to relax because they feel like things are moving in the right way. I think one of the biggest disservices that we do is we, we choose not to, to communicate because we're scared of the response. But if we can frame the communication in a way that shows um, you know, improvement, then ownership relaxes and they, they sort of get off your back on that. Yeah, and I think you've hit the nail on the head on that one. Um, you know, I remember a long time ago talking to owners about what they want to see, especially in downturn situations, and communication is key, and keeping them informed of all of the initiatives, the actions that you're undertaking, and the results that you're driving are absolutely critical during yeah. periods like and, this. And so, if, absolutely. If and if you fail, because you're go they're going to be thinking, you're going to put an initiative out there and it's not going to work, fail fast recover from it and then you communicate that we did this it didn't work the way we did but we made these two tweaks and now we're seeing the, you know this the change here because really that lets them know that you're responding to changes in the marketplace and you've got your finger on the pulse of things yeah and i loved what you said earlier on you said um you mentioned that kind of the people who are going to perform the best are the, those who are nimble and agility yes. is absolutely key in this in this particular marketplace so going back to spend uh, we do have a question which is i have a limited budget so if i was to buy one or two tools to help me drive the business what would those tools be um, well, I won't be completely self-serving and say buy my tool. Um, what I will say is you want to buy a, a strong um, business intelligence tool, something that's giving you insight to what's driving the business in your market. Mm -hmm. And you want to be able to see that down to the segmentation level, um, because that's going to help you understand where you may need to shift priorities to go after a particular segment. Um, the second thing is any tool that's going to make your sales team more effective, that's, that's showing them these are the accounts that are booking into your market at this moment. This is where you need to place your time. And, you know, it's kind of keeping in mind that just because, you know, it, it's this account. Well, if that account is an insurance company, you can bet that there are 15 other insurance companies that are also booking that you just don't know about this. So being able to understand not just the company, but what industry segment they're in so that you can hit other in industries, other companies in that same vertical. Yep, some good points. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got one more question uh, before we'll probably sign off. So is it okay to continue the business even if we don't know when tourism will boom again? Or should we stop for a while to lessen the higher expenses? Um, so basically, should, should we stop working for the moment to reduce expenses? Or should we kind of stroll along or, you know, try well, to manage through it? 
I, I'm never a fan of a fan of hibernation and um, and just sitting still. I think motion is, you know, that there's a there's an there's an entropy that goes with that. You know, the things that objects at rest stay at rest, objects of motion stay in motion. Um, so maybe it's not a full team effort because there may not be the business to support that. But I think every hotel needs at least one person on property that is still out there developing those relationships, making the phone calls returning the phone calls, um, um, those types of things, because this is going to turn on a dime. And spinning up a sales team is quickly is virtually impossible, especially if it turns on a dime, because then everybody's going to be hiring and you're going to be, you're going to get into price wars for trying to hire good salespeople. So making sure that you've protected at least a portion of your team, I think is absolutely critical and have them still doing sales activities, even if it's just building those relationships. One thing that I will say, if you're keeping those salespeople and staff, this is not the time to have um, specialized people. This is where you want your utility players. These are your people that need to be able to sell every seg segment that might book into your hotel. They know how to book it, deliver the contract, potentially do the BEO, and then potentially service it on the, uh, the other side of it. You can't have someone that they only book national associations above five, you know, 5,000 people. You, that, this is not that specialized time. And I'm not sure as an industry we ever should get back to that. I always, every hotel I've ever run, all of my sales team was equally adept at selling into any individual segment because you never know when someone's going to leave and someone's got to pick up a segment. So they need to be that. So yes, I think you need to have people out there. Maybe it's not a full compliment. It may only be one person dependent upon the size of your hotel. But if they're not doing it, when things recover, you're going to be left with the leftovers. And, um, you know, we don't know what the leftovers are going to look like, but it's probably not going to be all that great. No, and I think that's an absolutely fabulous point. You know, we need to become segmentation agnostic and mm -hmm. become generalists in sales. And yeah. I think that's something that, you know, everybody should take home with them. You know, what training are they doing back on their properties to ensure that they've got generalists moving forward rather than specialists? So that's yeah. absolutely fabulous. Um, so I think now, I think maybe there's room for literally one more question. We've got two minutes to go. Um, and this one, last but not least, is when will booking windows return to normal? Oh, um, you know, I honestly don't know. <laughs> this is one of those that I wished my crystal ball was working or that I had gotten my Hogwarts letter. Um, but I, I think we're going to see... I think transient will return probably a little bit deeper into the summer um, or will begin to stabilize. I don't know that it's going to return. You know, we saw this after the 2008 recession that that booking windows shortened dramatically yep. um, and then they lengthened a little bit, but they never returned to that 45 day window that we had seen um, before. So I think that we'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll stretch out a little bit, but we're not going to stretch out fully. Um, some of that's also dependent upon how, especially if you're at a market that is, that requires a lot of flight lift to get there, um, on how the airlines price. So if airlines aren't, don't, don't go back to there, you know, if you book at the last minute, your price goes dramatically up, um, then, then we're not going to see that because people know they can book at the last minute. But I think once transient demand, um, that leisure transient demand kicks in over the summer, that we'll begin to see that transient booking window lengthen quite a bit. I think we're going to have to get closer to um, not necessarily herd immunity, but more people vaccinated and our numbers coming down before groups going to get to a, a much more stable booking window. Because I just think people are going to be hesitant or at the very least where they're seeing that markets aren't closing suddenly. Um, yep. So I think the Middle East is probably a little closer to that. The United States, the same way. Europe, I think, is a very long, I mean, I think Europe is looking at probably two to three years before they get anywhere close to it. Yeah, I think you're probably right there. And on that note, there are a few green sheets com shoots coming up. So I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you so much for all the insights, Christy. An thank you. An absolutely fantastic session. And I'd like to thank all of the attendees for joining us today as well. So thank you, everybody. And we look forward to everybody joining us on the next one. Bye, guys. Have a nice day. Thank you very much.